Hello and welcome to our latest Fidelity Live call, with this being the third edition of, uh, of our focus on the Fidelity Asia Pacific Opportunity Strategy. This is managed by Anthony Schrom, who has joined us by phone from Singapore. I'm Gary Monaghan, Investment Director for Fidelity's Asia Equities business, and today's call will follow the same format as all of the others. I will pose a number of questions to Anthony, uh, but you too can ask your own questions via the Q&A tab on your Zoom interface. Now, this is at the top of the screen if you're on a tablet and at the bottom of the screen if you're on a laptop. I was, uh, I was looking at the attendee list and a number of people on the call have dialed into our previous two calls. So for those, I, I just want to let you know that I'll touch a little more on some of the larger holdings in the fund, as well as some of the top level thoughts. But there are also some new attendees on the list. So, so Anthony, with that in mind, can I please ask you to spend maybe a minute or two to running through, uh, running through your philosophy uh, and the investment approach. Uh, yeah, thanks, Gary. So uh, just to encapsulate the philosophy, uh, for me, it's all about trying to think about what will make a difference to fund performance, go into stock ideas in more depth, back your stock picking ability with a decent hit rate over time, you should outperform the benchmark. Um, if you've sized your positions accordingly as well. So that's that's really the core of what I believe. So um, you're never going to see a tail to this portfolio. We focus on 25 to 35 um, names. Um, in terms of the process, um, how that feeds through, um, really I just focus on three variables for each company that I'm looking at, the fundamentals, the sentiment and the valuation. And what I'm trying to do is um, pick at least two of these three um, directionally. So, for example, um, negative sentiment, I'd give it a tick. Cheap valuation, I'd give it a tick. And then fundamentals, um, cast my eye over that, work with the analyst and see if the market's misread something. And, and if that um, gets a tick, well, it's a prime candidate for inclusion into the portfolio. So that's, in essence, um, what I believe in and how I go about doing things. So... Um, when we think about uh, sentiment, um, very much on, on um, contrarian or um, pinning it down to a difference to the market as well. Okay, thank you. And, and I just want to now get into the, the nuts and bolts of the questions and answers. And, and I want to start with Hong Kong and the news around the security law being proposed by China. Now, I know you're not a political commentator, so I'm not going to ask your views in, in, in that regard. But, but I am interested in your take on how you think this will impact sentiment towards Hong Kong uh, and any thoughts on the impact on fundamentals? Uh, in essence, I think uh, the sentiment hit has outweighed the fundamental impact for Hong Kong. Um, a couple of things I'd say. One, um, you know, this has pre been a, a, a long time coming. Um, you know, you've, you've seen a lot of the smarter businessmen in Hong Kong um, removing their capital from that market for a number of years now, de-risking themselves in, in anticipation of something like this. So um, the, the writing was on the wall to a certain degree. Second point in terms of the fund, um, you may see that notionally compared to the benchmark, uh, it's about 10% overweight Hong Kong. Um, but on an economic basis, so essentially where the companies worth invested in generate their revenue and earnings from, um, I think the fund's only overweight about 200 basis points. So quite a different economic exposure. That feeds me on. That, that, let, sorry, that leads me on to the sentiment versus fundamental impact. Uh, you know, it's, it's been quite harsh um, the last week in terms of the stock market reaction. Um, but when you think about Hong Kong. Um, I think sentiment may get a bit worse in the short term, depending on how um, protests may pan out. But at the end of the day, Hong Kong is still the gateway for China into the rest of the world, i.e. capital markets, foreign direct investment uh, and the such. So, you know, I don't think they would run the risk of kind of killing the goose that lays the golden egg. So if sentiment gets a bit more negative from here. I think that could, uh, you know, provide some more interesting... Uh, buying opportunities for the portfolio. But again, I think the fundamentals versus the sentiment, there's probably a disconnect right now. Let's dig a little bit deeper into, um, into your, your holding in AIA, which is around 7.5% of the portfolio and, and probably has the most exposure to, to the Hong Kong mm -hmm. market um, mm -hmm. in, terms, in terms of revenues and, and such. Um, and what's yeah. your view here on both 
the sort of fundamentals and valuation and can you also look at this within the context of an uncertain economic environment for, for Hong Kong? Um, and, and finally, um, just where your view is different to the market on AIA. Yeah, so uh, in terms of AIA, you can see that share prices uh, come off quite materially again over the last week, week and a half. Um, kind of the big delta on the fundamentals is, is really mainland visitation into Hong Kong and buying US dollar denominated uh, policies. That always gets a lot of airtime and has been an incremental driver of the share price over the last 12, 18 months. Um, you know, that's essentially ground to, to nothing, but at the end of the day, it was about eight, nine percent of their value of new business. So stocks fallen more than that. Um, and I don't think that's a write off at all. So I think if you look through the, the trough in terms of the sentiment towards Hong Kong now, um, eventually it will be reopened. Um, protests will die down. It may get a little bit worse in the short term, but uh, you've got to look through that. And I think uh, mainland visitation will, will return. And, um, and uh, you know, I think the market will unwind some of that discount that's now applied. In terms of the other differentials um, versus the market, you know, we do have higher underlying insurance earnings. And again, um, AIA, what's maybe been forgotten in the short term is um, liberalization of the mainland Chinese market. And they can now go into pretty much uh, any province they want, uh, but they'll go in on a selective basis. So again, I think the long-term driver has pretty taken a bit of a backseat. So that's kind of what I'd say about uh, AIA. And, and, you know, we believe valuation remains attractive in, in the low 60 Hong Kong dollar per share range. So it still maintains a top five overweighting in the portfolio. Um, you, you mentioned just now that Hong Kong is I think around 10% overweight, which is your largest overweight position from a market perspective. Um, I, and I know you've maintained some of this, but given your contrarian approach, I mean, have you, have you been buying into Hong Kong? And are there actually any new ideas that, that you think that have been uh, added to the portfolio on the back of recent volatility? Uh, no, not yet. No, uh, no new idea um, has entered the portfolio, um, you know, since the events of last week. And um, what we have been doing with the portfolio, though, is adding to existing exposures, um, which, you know, some of them were new that came on board in the market route. So Galaxy, the Macau casino operator, um, Tektronic, um, which is a power tool equipment manufacturer. Um, those two combined would be off the top of my head, maybe eight, nine percent of the fund's assets. Um, so we've been, you know, buying those um, more recently, but nothing new has been added thus far or just yet. Um, I suppose it's linked somewhat to, to what's going on here in Hong Kong. Um, the US-China tensions uh, seem to have emerged again, and there's a lot more news flow around it. Um, what, what is your view here? And actually, how do you factor this into your analysis of stocks going forward? Yeah, I think um, the, the learnings pre-came over the last two to three years where the market has seemed to poorly predict political outcomes. So you can think US election, you can think Brexit, and it continues to get surprised by political outcomes. Um, last week was a was a, another case in point with with Hong Kong. Um, so in in my mind, I think uh, at the very highest level, what's happening with the U.S. and China, irrespective of the U.S. election outcome at the end of this year, uh, you know, I think this is going to be a long game of tit for tat. So expect more and more of these bumps to come through. Um, and, you know, as a portfolio manager, how do you kind of, you know, respond to that? Um, in, in my view, you've just got to pretty put a high discount factor on, on, on companies that you're looking to um, invest in. I, uh, that's, that's basically the way I, 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 go about, I go about doing it. Um, you, you own uh, a couple of names that are really so potentially in the crosshairs of the US-China tensions. and especially uh, Hangzhou Hike Vision comes to mind, which is on the US en US's entity list, uh, but is around 7.5 to 8% um, of, of, of the uh, NAV of the fund. Now, can you run through the, your, your reasoning for holding Hike Vision um, and, and how you think all of this 
news flow around tensions and entity lists will impact its business. Um, and finally, you know, how you look at the company within your uh, fundamental sentiment valuation sort of investment process and, 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 and what you think the market is missing. Yeah, I think um, when we look at Hike Vision, uh, we wind back the clock to when the fund started investing in the company last year. Um, in the first half, it was about 4% active, and then uh, around July, August, it stepped up to about 7 to 8% active. So just a bit of history, what happened there? Um, you know, there was tension starting to emerge on entity list, uh, you know, um, US technological equipment, i.e. Um, graphical processing units or, you know, GPU semiconductors, etc., maybe being um, banned for export to China. Um, provided an entry opportunity in my mind because uh, the market essentially just wrote off any international growth or value for their business. And then uh, you had the entity list um, officially announced, I think July, August last year, stock took another leg down and, um, you know, we bought into that uh, big dip and, um, you know, we've done relatively well since then. So in terms of how I think about it today, um, again, the market's having a bit of a rerun on, um, you know, let's call it tech transfer or tech sales to China. Um, you can, you know, wrap that up into a commentary about um, US content and, and how much of that's allowed to be in, in certain technological equipment and can that be exported to China? Does that slow down the learning ability um, of, of Hangzhou Hikes visions, um, algorithms and et cetera? Um, so the market's kind of concerned on, on that angle. Um, and uh, so sentiment is, is relatively negative. Um, when I think about it from fundamentals and valuation, I mean, the fundamentals, I mean, there's, there's a lot of growth opportunities um, ahead for someone like Hangzhou Hike Vision. That's, um, you know, pretty much anything that you can see with your eyes is something that they could uh, apply their equipment to eventually. Um, and it just keeps surprising me every time I meet them. Um, you know, there's another growth business that, that they're tapping into. Um, so, again, I think markets not giving much weight to international. Um, there's a long runway for domestic growth. And valuation kind of, you know, in the, in the mid high 20s um, has become attractive again. So um, when you think about it, you know, this, this techno technology transfer to, to China, it seems to disproportionately hit someone like Hangzhou High Vision. But um, at the end of the day, I mean, Tencent and Alibaba should be wrapped up in the same thing because, you know, if they can't get similar chips, then all these recommendation algorithms that they're running get really, really bogged down as well. So um, I think to a certain degree, the market's probably taken a harsher stick to, to Hangzhou High Division than others in the tech sector. And, and you know, we're placing our money with, with um, Hangzhou High Division at this stage. Um, Anthony, before moving on, uh, there's a couple of questions actually that have been coming through uh, with regards to uh, US ADR, so Chinese companies listed in, in, in the US, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of news in, around the risk that there's going to be some uh, some uh, uh, some sort of regulatory uh, things going on there where it's going to make it very difficult for Chinese companies to be listed there or get capital. Um, so two questions really. One is how much exposure do you have to US ADRs? And secondly, do you think that more and more Chinese companies will, will start to move back to either Hong Kong or back to the main uh, back to the mainland? Yeah, a few things there. One, the fund exposure um, is about two percent, maybe just over two percent, and that's coming through Yum China, which is a KFC Kentucky Fried Chicken operator in, in, in mainland China, listed in New York. So not material. Um, secondly, in terms of um, um, you know US listings and the US making it harder for Chinese companies to access the capital market there, I mean the reality is I don't think they are. They're just asking the Chinese companies to play by the rules of the US market. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that in my mind. Um, so you know going back to your, your last point about um, listings and where they may be, um, I think it's you know very clear that um, a bunch of them will reconsider listing in Hong Kong. I mean, you've already seen Alibaba um, list in Hong Kong. Um, others are making noises, and, and I think you know, something I read this week there's about 150, 170 companies um, that could make that transition. But 
don't kind of assume that it's imminent. Um, if you look at the legislation that the, that has been passed in the US, it um, kind of gives them a three year window. So um, again, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of time there to play out. Um, so shift moving on, um, last night at the NPC, we saw the Chinese authorities announce a, a 4 trillion yuan uh, fiscal pallet, uh, package. Um, in the past, you spoke about debt issues in China and, and the fact that they're a bit of an overhang to, to Chinese growth. And do you think that such news and, and fiscal packages are further exacerbating the, the debt problem down the road? In short, yes, because someone's got to pay for this at the end of the day. Uh, and, and the reality is, you know, you, you don't solve debt problems with more debt. Um, if you look at the productivity of the incremental dollar of debt coming out of China, that's been falling for a long period of time um, and that's going to continue falling. So um, that's, that's my view on, on the stimulus. I mean, be it infrastructure or be it consumer or whatever, ultimately there's, there's no free lunch. Um, and I think uh, the way the market looks at it, they've always anticipated a, a, a stimulus, um, you know, even before COVID. Um, there was, uh, you know, there's always some sort of rolling stimulus that was announced, be it, you know, autos or white goods or, you know, housing on and off. Um, so in essence, this is, economy, this is an economy that has to have continual annual stimulus, which at the highest level, if you ask me, is a negative sign. Um, so, you know, you saw that announcement yesterday, stock market didn't really move on it. Um, it was essentially pricey and expected and, and we move on from here. I know there's, there's not a huge amount of, of precise detail around this package at the moment, um, just apart from numbers and some high level sort of rhetoric. Um, but are there any areas that you think will benefit from this and, and in particular benefit stocks in the portfolio? Um, I think if you look at the way the stimulus is shifting, I mean, in the past it was very heavily skewed to FAI, um, property um, in the more recent years it's been trying to shift the economy away from that to more consumption um, so I mean one, one of the companies in, in, in the portfolio that we have is, is media uh, you know household white goods so make predominantly air conditioners but um, you know personal um, home appliances and um, and uh, large white goods like washing machines and, and fridges um, you know there's a continual upgrade cycle going on in China there. There's also improving energy efficiency, which will feed through to new air con demand. Um, that's one that immediately comes to mind in terms of consumption. Um, you know, at the periphery, not getting a lot of love at the moment, but, um, you know, domestic tourism, um, you'd expect that to to, to um, rebound somewhat. But again, it's, it's, I think the market's a bit too scared to, to touch that just yet, but by and large, um, you know, that, that's that's the way I kind of see the shift more from FAI property to to personal consumption, um, trying to trying to stimulate growth by that aspect. But then again, I mean, if you look at the Chinese consumer, I mean, their their their, their balance sheets aren't as pristine as they were ten years ago. So again, it's just trying to pull forward demand, um, which which I don't think is going to work long term. Um, so Anthony, we, when we speak to clients about ideas, particularly new ideas, um, uh, we talk about how they exhibit uh, a contrarian tilt. So I'm, I'm quite interested to hear what you, which companies you consider to have them, uh, so the, the, or the companies you consider the most contrarian ideas in the portfolio. Um, so when, when I look at those, uh, you know, we, you can call them shipping. We've got China Merchant, China Merchants Energy Shipping in the portfolio. We've got Pacific Basin. Um, Pacific Basin is more skewed towards, um, you know, small, mid-sized bulk vessels. So, um, you know, agri commodities, um, iron ore, um, timber, and, and the like. Um, China Merchants is more skewed towards very large, very large crude carriers or VLCCs. Um, you know, at, a, at, the, at, at the highest level, you're not getting a lot of supply growth, not getting a lot of new vessel orders. Um, you've got IMO 2020, which just passed. 
Um, you've got IMO 2030 coming up. I mean, vessels have got 15, 20 year lives. No one really knows what regulations will be there. Um, so, you know, we see a favourable supply side outlook for the next two to three years. Um, and again, as long as crude stays in contango, and if that contango gets exacerbated, they'll be very positive to, to VLCC carriers. Um, so we're, we're still in a contango, um, and, and I don't see the supply demand kind of uh, rebalancing any anytime soon. Um, same thing with uh, Pacific Basin. Um, you know, when you're looking at these kind of um, industries, it's just best to look at the supply side. And, and again, that looks quite favorable. Valuations, very acceptable, uh, very supportive for these companies. And it's just a matter of waiting for the fundamentals to play out. Um, when I think about some of the other contrarian um, investments in the portfolio, um, things that come to mind is, is a travel related sectors. So um, the portfolio um, has Flight Centre, which is a um, travel agency um, listed in Australia. And as I mentioned uh, um, early on Chinese domestic tourism, we have uh, Shangri-La, which is a hotel operator. So also what came into the portfolio was Auckland International Airport um, in possibly March or April. Um, huge rights issue. So I think when you when you when you look at um, the changes, um, Auckland International Airport wasn't there, Flight Centre wasn't there, um, Pacific Basin wasn't there. Um, four or five months ago. Um, and that probably gives you some sort of flavour of, of where I'd see the, the more contrarian aspects to the portfolio. Um, so if, if I look at the portfolio two months ago, so right at the end of Q1, you, you were at the maximum 35 stocks uh, in, in the Asia Pacific Opportunity Fund and, and around 2% in cash. Uh, if I look today, so two months on, we're, we're at 29 names and, and back up to it's around six and a half to seven percent in cash. Um, there, there is an argument that sentiment is you know, not that positive. So, so is this change in terms of reducing number of names, increasing cash, a reflection of fundamental concerns or, or rich valuations? And also, can you touch on what what you have been selling? Yeah. So, um, I think if I look at some of the um, um, bigger changes to the portfolio since then. Um, it was, I think, it was a clear, it was a clear thesis break on 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 energy. So, um, the fund exited SK Innovation, exited Sinopec, um, China Petroleum and Chemical, exited TSRC in in Taiwan. Um, I think a fair few of those stocks. I mean, the other ones that got exited were ITC and 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 Hang Seng Bank. Um, so going into COVID, the fund had exposure to those. Um, they were relatively beaten up in aggregate, kind of did their job um, in terms of relative performance during the route. And, um, and uh, you make a reassessment of the fundamentals, um, the valuation, and to me, um, I don't have a lot of conviction in, in, uh, in, um, in the energy outlook. Um, I mean, VLCC crude shipping is, is different um, and I'm happy to talk through that if you'd like. So that's uh, where a, a decent um, exit came from. Um, the other one is, is financials. Um, I'm a bit concerned about the financial sector um, outlook over the next few years, mainly in terms of um, the way governments will, I think, manipulate yield curves, net interest margins are likely to be under pressure. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a long slog on an economic recovery. Um, and therefore you've got NPL issues coming down the pipeline. So you've got to be quite selective. And, and we exited Bank Rakyat in Indonesia um, this month or, or, or last month. Um, and, uh, you know, we've had a couple of um, winners. I mean, namely Angel Yeast in China. Um, I think it's been a very, very good winner for the portfolio this year. And valuations are just way too rich now. Um, I think sentiment way too positive. And, um, Fundamentals have, have improved over the last few months, but I don't think that really justifies where the, where the stock is priced today. So um, that's, that's uh, what I'll probably say on, on, on your question. So, so when you look at the portfolio today and what areas worry you the most, but, but also actually quite interesting from my perspective, what, what actually excites you the most? Uh, in terms of what 
what worries me the most about the portfolio and it's it's i think uh i don't think the market's figured out how it wants to react to to what's just happened i mean you've had the initial euphoria the bounce um and you know markets pretty for the last month have kind of gone nowhere uh, i think they've rolled slightly and you've got this big debate you know is it is it growth is it value um is it something else don't know um, so kind of when, when i look at periods of when the mark when the fund has not performed well it's when sentiment has kind of been excessive in one direction or another and, and the fund's not positioned there so you kind of feel a little bit awkward that i think the market's still trying to feel its way um through this but um, you know, when you stretch it out two to three years, I, I feel comfortable with with the companies that we've assembled um, in the portfolio. In terms of where I see, um, you know, interesting opportunities, um, again, it's, you know, I think we've got scope to buy into weakness on um, existing positions that we have. So the fund never goes maximum overweight or maximum weight into a investment straight away. Um, so I can give you an example today. I mean, CSL in Australia, uh, you know, I think that's going to be a, a long-term winner. I was happy where the funnel was buying it um, during the correction. And we're sitting at about 150 basis points overweight, but you know, under the right circumstances, that could be four, 500, 600 basis points overweight. So I've really got my eye on, um, some of these uh, longer, uh, Tektronic is another one. Um, and, you know, just keep your mind open to what else could come from left field, but um, nothing has kind of emerged just yet um, that, I'm that I'm working on for imminent inclusion. I'm, I'm you know, quite happy with what we've got and, and um, there's plenty of scope to, to add more capital to some of our um, existing positions. And we've had uh, two, two additional questions that have come through Zoom and uh, first one, um, you know, you have expressed some concern around the outlook for earnings and, and maybe valuations are not that attractive. Uh, you, the, in the portfolio, you can't short you, and you don't use options. So, so how are you actually protecting the portfolio uh, on, on, in terms of uh, on downside protection? Yeah, so the way I think about it is just the companies that we invest in, how do you think they're going to perform relative to the market over the next two to three years? Um, you're right, you know, there's no kind of hedging on futures or options or anything like that. I I kind of, be, before you go into investments, and again, um, you know, December, January last year, uh, a few companies were added to the portfolio, and you always ask yourself, well, if there's a big drawdown. How do you think the portfolio is going to perform? How do you think these companies are going to perform? So that's something that I ask myself always before you get into an investment. Um, that's, that's the main thing. Um, and again, you know, if you're buying at what you think are attractive valuations, sure, the market may go down 30, 40%, but you know, you've probably got a better starting point than, than that and you should outperform. Um, so, Roughly, that's that's the way I go about doing it. Just question yourself: How do you think an investment would perform in a, in a, in, a, in a down market? And then at the portfolio level, um, just looking at the the risk assessment. Um, so, the individual security correlations: How are they playing out? Are you inadvertently doubling down on correlation? Um, are you introducing more risk than what you're comfortable with? Um, so, uh, that's that's the other way I'd go about um, thinking it through. So. Again, December last year, the way we assessed it, um, we had added some names. Um, I asked myself, look, if markets go down, how do you think it's going to perform at the individual security level? At the portfolio level, um, theoretically, we were less risky than the benchmark. Um, that kind of played out through the through the whole crisis. Um, and now kind of, uh, again, we're not too dissimilar to the benchmark, but slightly riskier. Um, I can understand why. I mean, that comes through some slightly higher beta exposures that the fund has, has bought, but I don't think the portfolio is overly skewed or, or exposed to the downside. And, and I am very conscious of time, and I know we've sort of overrun by one minute, but we, we do have one final question, and 
That's with regards to an off-benchmark position in ASML, which is a Dutch-listed company. Mm -hmm. um, just can you very quickly uh, touch on why you own it? I think it's a better investment than Samsung Electronics, um, SK Hynix and um, TSMC. So um, the fund has scope to, to kind of buy securities outside of the region, as long as you can kind of demonstrate tangible evidence um, of, of you know, revenue assets or earnings coming from Asia, PacX Japan. So if you look at ASML, over 80% of the earnings um, come from Asia Pacific, um, including Japan. Um, if you X out Japan, it's about 79%. So uh, tangible demonstration of, of earnings coming out of Asia. Um, that's therefore the economic risks in my mind are, are more skewed towards Asia. I think it's a better company than the others that I've mentioned. And that's reflected in the bet dies that the portfolio is running. And at the margin, um, you know, I'd be looking to allocate more capital to ASML. It kind of fits into that bucket that I was talking about early with CSL. Um, you get an opportunity. Um, you know, I'd look to add more and, and uh, again, if the opportunity presents itself, um, dial down TSMC. Um, so, and again, if you want to back up the truck even further, um, you know, you've got the memory players at, at one end of the spectrum, like your SK Hynix, Micron, Samsung Electronics, you've got foundries kind of in between that and um, ASML. So uh, what I'm saying is ASML is basically the, the arms manufacturer for everything downstream, um, effective monopoly. And uh, that's why we own it in the portfolio. And, and it's one that I'll be looking to add to at, at the right time. Excellent. And, and thank you uh, for everyone joining today. We're out of time now. And in fact, we've over on a little bit. Um, thank you, Anthony, for your time and your answers. The uh, transcript and uh, uh, recording of this call will be made available on Fidelity websites. And if you want any further information, please do contact your local Fidelity representative. Um, thank, you, thank you everyone for joining today. I know your time is very precious and we appreciate that you joined us. Have a good weekend.